Hello, welcome to our midweek service uh, for 9.23, and we're going to be in Samuel again. First Samuel will be in chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, you want to continue praying for uh, Eric Hickman's going to have a procedure on his leg and a biopsy on the 15th of October. Uh, Kara Alexander going through um, chemo, uh, Mike Alexander recovering from hip. Continue to pray for Richard, who's can, in, still in Stanford and got a uh, a lot of health issues going on with him, but there, there are some improvements. So just be praying for him and be with uh, Barbara. She can't visit him and be with him. Uh, be with Ryan and Shaley, our son and daughter-in-law. They'll be moving to Colorado from South Dakota in October 2nd. And they uh, 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 need some finances to move and other things like that. So just be praying for that. We just pray for um, those situations. And then P. Indiana's daughter, Ryan, who's in the hospital with pneumonia just pray that she's doing better our heavenly father we pray for these requests we leave them in your hands pray for especially ryan and uh, richard who are in the hospital and pray for their loved ones who can't visit them and be with our study today lord help it to be a good one as we walk through your word in jesus name we pray amen uh first samuel chapter seven and uh we talked last week about how the, the ark got returned to Israel. And so we're going to talk about the, this idea and subject of repentance and returning to God. Um, and in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, 1 Samuel, The men of Kirjath jearam came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar, the son of his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So the ark is back in place, and it was that the ark remained in Kirjas and Yerim a long time. It was there 20 years. And so the ark is returned, um, but they don't bring it to the tabernacle. It's still not in its proper place, uh, but it is back. They, they consecrate Eliezer, who was probably a Levite, and to, to kind of care for it. Uh, but obviously, because it's not in the proper place, it's still not going to be used for sacrifices. But remember, it's become a bit of a good luck charm. You know, in the last battle that they had any success with the Philistines, they, they, it's been a while. And when they were losing, they brought this ark out as kind of a token of, man, this power, this is, we got God with us now. Uh, but they still lost because they hadn't turned back to God. And they were kind of using religion. We talked a little about that. And so the ark was taken, but when it was taken, everywhere the ark went, it brought boils and, and plagues. And, and, and because even though Israel had turned from God, the world still has no right to mess with God and mess with Israel. And so they, last chapter, give it back. They sent it, remember, on the two cows, with, um, and they brought it, they offered sacrifices. And now the ark rests in Kurzath Jerem. Well, if you look at the end of verse 2, this is really interesting. Uh, the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. That lamenting is this idea of um, being sad and mourning. It's not been a great uh, time for them. Um, God really wasn't there. His ark is there, so they have religion. And this happens a lot when people start going back to church or they start reading spiritual books or they turn to whatever it might be to draw them comfort. It doesn't last, it doesn't work. But a true, true relationship with Jesus Christ is life changing. You are a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things become new, and you are changed. Uh, religion doesn't change you. It might help you temporarily for a little while on the outside, but your inner person is still the same until you have Christ and that Holy Spirit. Um, so even though they had the ark, it did not bring contentment. Um, and the cities were in ruin. Philistines were still ruled over them. Uh, they still weren't offering sacrifices, obviously, because it's not in the temple, even though they may have tried to do it in the wrong way. Uh, but they don't have God because there hasn't been a turning away from their sins, which we're going to see. And I think that's what we have a little bit in, in, in nationwide. There's, there's still a semblance of religion out there, but 
we need to turn away from sin. We need to turn away from the sins of abortion, sins of hatred, and all those other things, and turn to God. And um, that's what happens in, in verse 3. Samuel spoke to them. Well, where's Samuel been? It's been 20 years, and he's, he's obviously been still sharing the word. The Bible says that that he would, God said he'd allow none of his words to fall to the ground. Um, he's not involved in all of this uh, foolishness of the ark and bringing it out and taking it in. And so he has a word for them. And here's the word. Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, if you return to the Lord with all your hearts, put away foreign gods, the asterisk from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord. Serve him only. He would deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So that's why they're still lamenting. They're still under this rule of the Philistines, even though they got the ark back now. They just don't understand because they're relying on religion and not Christ. So what does Samuel tell them to do? The same thing any preacher would say today, the same thing that was said in, in Acts 3.19, repent and therefore be converted that your sins may be blotted out. It's a return to God. But this verse is very interesting to break down. So let's, well, let's look at it carefully. He says, uh, if you return to the Lord with all your hearts, that's the key. This, it's a heart issue first. Then he says, and if you will put away your foreign gods, but putting away the foreign gods just as an act of obedience or an act of uh, religious ceremony doesn't work. We talked about that last couple of weeks here. But if their heart is turned to God, and turn, if you will, to uh, Matthew 22. Matthew 22, we're going to look at verse 34. And this is the idea of turning your heart to God. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Look what it says. Uh, Matthew 22, and we're going to look at verse 34. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, one of them, a lawyer, asking him a question, testing him, said, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? So we're trying to trick Jesus. Jesus' answer in Matthew 22 is this, verse 37. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. See, the law hangs on your love for Christ, your love for your neighbor. The law is just a bunch of activities. But they hang on this. If, if I love God, I don't want to sin against him. If I love God, I want to do right. If I love God, I want to follow him. If I don't love God, then they just become activities and actions. We talked a little bit about that on Sunday. We want to fall back to that lesson. Um, and so it starts with the heart. And I love how he says that in verse 3. If you, back to 1 Samuel chapter 7. If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away those foreign gods, the asterisk. And that's kind of like in Joshua 24 when the people said, you know, we are going to put away our gods and we're going to do this. And Joshua says, that's for me and my house will serve the Lord. But if you don't do it out of love, it's not going to last. He put that monument up because uh, he doubted their love for God. And that love is followed by action. And that action for them was to put away asterisks and the bales. And it's interesting that the, the word, the, the god asterisk and the female god is of fertility. So it had to do with their sex lives. Baal was the god of, of fertile land and had to do with their monetary gain and their growth of uh, crops. So once again, we see that in our own culture today that we have traded God for the God of sex. This, this nation is, is obsessed with it. We wanna identify with gender or transgender or homosexuality. And, and it, wherever you stand on all of these things, we know where God stands, 
But what we have is a nation that's so obsessed with sex that we even identify ourselves by our sexual preferences. And that's an, a natural thing. Uh, you are a creation of God, wonderfully and mighty made uh, to build your whole entire life, not founded on Christ, but founded on your sexual preference. That's what they did. They had this goddess of Asterisk because again, that, that human flesh. And if you'll notice that, that when people draw away from God, it always falls into this sexual thing. I mean, you can read Romans one that says it there. The other thing they're obsessed with their, their possessions and their monetary. And, and we have votes and people are voting this year based on who's going to give them the most things and allow them to have sex any way they want to. And, and, you know, to hell be with our country. It doesn't matter as long as I get my stuff and get to do what I want. And they were the same way. And these were Israelites, Israelites that had the, the sex God and the, and the fertile God. And, and it's always been that way. When Jesus fed the 5,000, they immediately wanted to take him by force and make him king. And Jesus said, no, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. It's not physical stuff. And they wanted Jesus because they knew he could feed them. That's what the 5,000 wanted. And so he says to them, look, you got to turn your heart back to God and then get rid of all the stuff that you've put ahead of them. It's no different today. So the children of Israel in verse 4 did what he said. They put away the bales and the asterisks and served the Lord only. Samuel said, Gather all the Israelites to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together in Mizpah, drew water, poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. So here's Samuel, the last judge. And they pour water out to God. Repent, therefore, and be converted. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins. And they, they say these words that David later said, against you, God, only have I sinned. We have sinned. And that idea of pouring water is, is to pour out. Uh, it's, it's, here's what it says in Lamentations 2, 19. It says, cry out in the night at the beginning of the watches, pour out your heart like water before the face of the Lord. So that idea of crying out and pouring out your heart like water. So the physical pouring out of water represents them pouring out their heart to God in, in repentance. And it's, it represents, if I could cry this many tears, I would cry, God. And so it's a symbolic thing of, of them pouring out their lives to God. And they're, they're weeping and they're repenting confessing their sins, fasting, and praying. And when the disciples couldn't cast out demons and went to Jesus and said, what was the problem? Why can't we do this? And he says, this only comes by prayer and fasting. So there's true repentance here. There, there's everything that you would want in it. There's prayer. There's fasting. There's the man of God with them. There's, there, there's turning from their wicked ways, getting rid of these false gods. They are following, just like kind of that cycle of judges. And right now, they're, they're following it in a strong way, thanks to the leadership of Samuel and the patience of God, waiting 20 years. This is good for us, because in this country, there's, there's a need to repent and turn back to God. And it may not happen in the next three months. It may not happen in, in our lifetime. But God was patient and waited 20 years. And, but things got so bad. And things are getting bad here. That's not altogether a bad thing and because it could draw and lead to a revival, a turn from this country. I know we're having the, the prayer walk and everything in Washington Saturday, uh, but God's people, you know, that's a great thing. But public shows of, of commitment to God is good, but only repentance of God's people to turn from their wicked ways. Uh, will bring revival to this country. We've got to do it. Second uh, Chronicles 7.14. So verse 7, interesting thing happens. When the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. 
So the Philistines are looking at Mizpah, what's happening? They're weeping, they're crying, putting away their false gods, pouring water, lamenting towards God. To the world, that's a sign of weakness. And men, this is important. The world sees your repentance, your crying out to God as weakness. It is not. It is strength. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And, and when we are weak, we are strong. Paul says, I'm strong in my infirmities. To the Philistines, it looked like, man, these guys have had it. They've quit. Let's go get them. The Israelites were afraid of them. Look at verse 8. The children of Israel said to Samuel, do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. Even though they're doing the right thing now, they have had a series of failures. When they brought the ark out and it got taken, that was a defeat to them. Even though the ark is back, it's still been 20 years, and they just haven't been able to, to feel the presence of God. The ark didn't help them any. Why? Because they hadn't repented yet. Now that they've repented, they should be confident. So what's interesting is the Philistines see them as weak, and the Israelites feel weak, even though they should be strengthened in the fact that they've done everything right now that they were supposed to do, and they should have done. And history bears this out, that, that God is, is, blesses those who come to him in repentance. And it, the Bible says, I resist the proud, I give grace to the humble. And we've seen that throughout history. So the answer is to keep crying out. And so what did they ask Samuel to do? He says, Samuel, please do not cease to cry out for us. Just keep crying out. What do we do in this time of history? Keep crying out to God. What are we going to do on November 2nd? Cry out to God. What are we going to do on November 4th? Cry out to God. What are we going to do two, five years from now? Cry out to God. Continue daily. And that's what Samuel did. He took the suckling lamb, offered it as a burnt offering to the Lord. Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. That's us. We're the Samuels of this country. We're the Samuels crying out to God for, for his will to be done, for uh, forgiveness and for repentance of the country. And Samuel was offering up the burnt offering. The Philistines drew near the battle against Israel, but the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines, that the day was so confused, that day and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out to Mizpah, pursued, pursued the Philistines, and drove them back as far as below Beth Car. So they drive out the enemy. They haven't had a victory like this in years, in decades. What was the difference? Prayer, fasting, repentance giving their heart to God. And God was gracious and patient and gave them victory. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Do you have this faith? God says if you have it as big as a mustard seed, you could move a mountain. But these only come by prayer and fasting. And God gave them victory. Just like in the storm, when they cried out to God and God said, oh, you men of little faith, do you have faith in a God that will bring revival to a country, protect this nation, and maneuver the leaders to do what his will is? Verse 12, great verse. Samuel took a stone, set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called his name Ebenezer, saying, thus far the Lord has helped us. That's a great. Uh, if you sing uh, the song, um, here I raise my fount of, come thou fount of every blessing. There's a verse in there that says, here I raise my Ebenezer. And the word Ebenezer is stone of help. The Bible says that behold, God is our helper. The Bible says, fear not for I am with you. I am your God, I will help you, I will uphold you. The Bible says, say we confidently, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what man shall do to me. Psalm 121, one says, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where does my help come? Hebrews 13, five and six says, keep your life free from money and 
content that you have. For he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my helper. God is our helper. Do you trust in God to help you? Psalm 46.1 says, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Do you rely on God for help? That's what it means to raise your Ebenezer, to, to raise your consciousness, to know that God is there to help you. God is your helper, and he will be there for you. So what happens in verse 13, the Philistines were subdued and did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. And we have to stand on that, that watchtower. We have to stand in the gap. We have to be Samuels. I, don't, I wouldn't compare ourselves to Samuel, what a man of God he was. But we have to follow in his footsteps as far as leading and crying out to God daily for the uh, presence of God and help of God. Raise our Ebenezer. Raise the fact that we need your help. The Lord is our helper. Look at verse 14. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath. And Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also, there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. You want peace? You tired of all the fighting? Tired of all of the... The, the bickering, we want peace, we got to turn back to God. This nation needs help. The Lord is our helper. Repent. Turn, give your heart totally to God and preach that message. That's the message. As this world gets a little more difficult, a little more tr full of trials, then we have the message. Repent. Turn to God. And we have the answer. And if, if people will do that, I don't know how many it's going to take. If my people call by my name. So Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He became the final judge. Um, he went from year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and judged Israel to all those places. But he always returned to Ramah, for his home was there. There he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So this influence that Samuel had didn't stop. And that's our influence. The influence is to continue to let people know that God is our helper and he is the only way uh, that this nation will ever be truly have revival is repentance. And we cry out to God and we call out to God and we do actions first. Remember, Samuel said, turn your hearts to God, then get rid of your idols. So we just want to preach that message of turning our hearts to God. Heavenly Father, ask you to bless our country. We ask you, God, to be with our uh, leaders, be with the election, be with our homes and our churches. Lord, as we, uh, Lord, truly turn our hearts to you. Help us to do that. Turn from our wicked ways and follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. I hope to see you Sunday morning at nine o'clock. Again, we're still doing outdoor live services and uh, hope to see you. If not, we'll certainly be on uh, Facebook and YouTube again. Bye.